You may hear some Auburn fans brag about the latest transfer addition for the Tigers, but can he make an impact on this team in 2022? Well, Zach, I, I actually just finished crushing some chicken farm, and I'm, I'm freaking ready to rock and roll. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Black. I mean, thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Joining us as he does every Monday, Lindsey Crosby of Auburn Daily and the host of Locked On MLB Prospects. Lindsay, thankfully, before we recorded on this Father's Day, happy Father's Day to you and all of those um, fathers watching. You as well. But uh, Auburn has added Western Kentucky transfer, Marcus Bragg. And going into the offseason, there was a lot of questions of the depth at Auburn's edge position, right? We always felt good about Derek Hall. We felt good about Eculiotto. We felt good about Dylan Brooks being that number three guy pushing him into a bigger role. But who was after that? Thoughts of Joko Willis moving over there. Can Cam Riley do it? There's been a lot of speculation. And I think they addressed that a little bit with the addition of Marcus Bragg. Um, there are some things to like. He lined up everywhere, according to Pro Football Focus. And we'll put up his chart if you're watching on YouTube. But lined up pretty evenly, Lindsay, across the board when it comes to, you know, playing outside, playing defensive tackle, playing in, playing right and left outside linebacker. So you got to love that. You have to love that. Um, but I, I don't I don't love this addition. I, I think he's okay. I mean, if you look at it, it's like, okay, this is the fifth edge rusher on Auburn's team. I'm cool with that. But with a guy that has one year left of eligibility – how do you convince a dude like that to come here that's already in the portal, that's gotten a little bit better every year that he was at Western Kentucky? Um, surely if he committed to Auburn, they sold him something. But I, I just don't see how he's better, remotely better than any of the depth pieces. I don't think he's better than Joko Willis. I don't think he's better than, than, um, than Dylan Brooks. And so it's like, is this guy really just the fifth dude and that's how he's going to spend his last year of college eligibility? It's an interesting ad. Yeah, and when I think about it, kind of the, the thought process for me is, were they telling him he was going to be a position better than the fifth spot on the roster? Right. Knowing that once the season starts, like he, that's it. He's not going to leave because it's his last year of eligibility. So is that something where he has a different understanding of what his role is than they do? I don't want to think that the coaches are fundamentally dishonest and would do that. Right. And so to me, it tells me that they either – have to value his experience. The yeah. fact that he has played for multiple seasons at the position when Joku Willis is moving from linebacker to edge and Dylan Brooks is still has, did not really have a role on the field last yeah. season. Richard freshman. Right. Yeah. Uh, or there is, they, they want the comfort of having the versatility all across the front, a guy who can, they can put it linebacker. They can put it in. Yeah. He, they can play tackle. He even had two snaps at nose tackle. I mean, you could theoretically put him anywhere um, from gap to gap. I mean, from like from from one edge of the of the defense to the other, and let him play. Uh, so there must be some sort of value that Brian Harson sees there. There's also uh, there's always a, the possibility that maybe his girlfriend's here for pharmacy school, who know, or vet school. Like, yeah, there, yeah. there could be off the field things we don't know about. But it is an odd fit as far as. Why not take a dude that had multiple years of eligibility who you can coach up and get better? Yeah, I mean, to me, Lindsay, this addition seems like uh, it seems similar to Auburn adding, you know, the Memphis defensive lineman, Morris Joseph. Both of those guys, pretty versatile. Um, I think Morris Joseph offers more of an immediate punch, which makes sense with a one year addition. And um, you, you're like, I mean, like Bragg, you're seeing them take that step forward, you know, from, a, you know, a, a group of five school to a, to a power five school, specifically an SEC caliber school there. And so 
in most cases, you're going to see your role drop, but you get more opportunity because you're on a bigger stage. And so, but with his last year of eligibility, once again, like you nailed it, everybody's life situation is different. And, and, and we don't know everything going on in this kid's life. And I think, I mean, he makes Auburn's roster better because there's a ton of scholarships to go around. I just think it's interesting why you go out and get a guy who it's his last year of eligibility and his path to playing time just does not seem clear to me. Lindsay, there's a, there's a YouTube account. It's like, um, it's like Western Kentucky archives. I, mm -hmm. I think is the name of it. And he just archives games. And so I watched, um, I watched three games of just the defense. Um, even though the, the Patriots did draft Zappy, their quarterback, it was hard not to watch the offense there too, to see Mac Jones's backup. But I think, uh, you know, with what I saw, his first step is not that explosive. He was never the first guy off the ball. He was high. I mean, his, his pad level was just high. Um, he got washed out and over-pursued a lot on outside plays. And he was on the ground a lot. And so I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know where that is. And this is when they were playing, you know, teams that are not SEC caliber teams. So, I have a lot of questions about this addition. Once again, you know, I don't want to bash the kid. I think he makes Auburn's roster better. I'm just confused as to why he did it. Why he's choosing to come here for his last year of eligibility. Is it possible that the coaching staff wanted to find a veteran so that if you were, because you're, you're so reliant on that starting punch of Hall and Leota. So is it possible that they were concerned? Well, if one of those guys gets hurt, if we lose one of those guys, then we're asking somebody who doesn't have experience to step up and start in the SEC, and we need that base level of competency. Like, is that possible, or is it something where watching him play, absolutely, you, yeah, you don't even think you're getting that base level of competency? No, I, I do think it's that. And, and hey, maybe coaching helps him. I mean, the guy has the you know, you talk about clay. I mean, just clay that this coaching staff can mold. Six four two sixty. I mean, if this kid's a redshirt sophomore, we're talking about it totally different. Like, okay, maybe he doesn't contribute this year, but could really, really figure it out a season or two. But the context changes because he's done after this season. And, and that's why I'm looking at it this way. Maybe I'm being too harsh on the kid. Um, but to me, you know, everything that you just said, I think describes more as Joseph more so than, than, than this kid. And look, he was in the portal for a while. Maybe he, you know, thought he'd get more offers than he did. Um, and like you said, maybe there's other stuff going on in his life. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's interesting that he's already redshirted. He spent five years in. I mean, he spent five years in college, so it's not like he has a COVID year that he can he can take. He's from Miami, right? So. Also, not necessarily a thing where you kind of. I know he went to uh, junior college in Mississippi, Miss how to Mississippi Delta. So maybe it's something where he's like, I want to be back down south, and I don't want to go back to Flo uh, to to the state of Florida. It's an uh -oh. odd fit, and I'm just I'm looking for that thing. I'm looking for that that key that's like this is why the decision was made. Did he have multiple options that he picked us? Why did we go out and get him? And we just love some more clarity. Right. All right. I want to talk about the upside of what he brings in just a moment right here on Locked on Auburn. Then we'll jump into the College World Series with Lindsay. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, news, and everything else going on at Bet Online. Of course, your futures for college football in the NFL, those are the hottest things right now and of course every night you can get in on the action with major league baseball it's all happening all the time at bet online where the game starts so there are some things to like about marcus bragg um like i said 6'4 260 pounds and he can do other things other than edge but it really seems like based off of reports that i think this is where they want to slot him as a depth piece at the edge position and maybe he can beat out Joko Willis. And like the fourth edge guy will play. I, I think the fourth edge guy plays in this defense. I don't know how much, 
And obviously, God forbid something happened to Derek Hall or Ekuliota, then all of a sudden this is a totally different conversation and it's good that he's on the field. I still think you could argue that you'd rather take the upside of somebody else than him, but uh, I, I think it, I think Auburn fans will be glad that he's on the roster if that were the case. But you know, according to Pro Football Focus, his strongest thing was coverage. I don't know if that's how he'll be used, and I think it's a smaller sample size, but his coverage grade was 72.9, which is pretty good. His overall grade was just over a 67, um, looking at 2021. So that's something that's interesting because you you look at his size, and it's like 6'4", 260. That doesn't scream like effective in coverage, but I like that. I like that I saw that. Yeah, it really kind of feels like a small sample size thing there. And I, I oh, was yeah. able to find, you know, some quotes where he had talked to some folks and and said that Rock Bellatoni kind of told him that there's only two people that are really kind of in pin for playing time as far as Hall and Leota, and that everybody else is going to rotate in and get a lot of plays. Right. And so to me, the appeal uh, – for a brag to to come to Auburn is a chance to play in, like you said, a bigger stage, a bigger scene against better opponents, put on some quality tape if he's trying to go to the next level after this last season. If he's taking his COVID year to try to improve, I mean, he's making a business decision here, kind of like Tony Fair did, kind of like a couple guys we've seen who have taken that final year of eligibility, transferred in to try to get some sort of tape against Power 5 teams to go pro. That's kind of what I think is happening if I had to kind of guess here. Oh, and and I do know that from what I've seen, I was looking at the roster and things like that. Uh, um, Dylan Brooks obviously is the third. Uh, Joko Willis is still listed as a linebacker. So he sure. may be working in the edge room. He may be something where we're doing this and we're going to use him and you know, like break glass in case of emergency. Mm-hmm. But maybe they're not necessarily planning on this being a permanent thing. So they said, let's bring in just a veteran, whoever we can get, and then we have a recruit coming in that will be that that another guy in that room. Joker Willis is going to eventually end up back at linebacker, possibly. All right. So Marcus Bragg last year played 400 defensive snaps. In 2020, he played 146. Then in 2019, he played 78. So it was it's good to see his his role grow mm-hmm. with Western Kentucky. How many snaps do you think he will play? For Auburn this year and just for perspective I'm looking at you know Roe Torrance played 113 last year okay I don't think he'll have that big of a role Zakevius Walker played 70 Caleb Johnson played 66 Dre Butler played 28 so I'm thinking he's somewhere in that range I think it's more than 28 I don't know if it's more than you know Roe Torrance at 113 does he does he play 100 snaps next year now that I've kind of given you some some sample sizes there I'm taking the under Uh, if everybody, and this is a big if, if everybody's healthy, the thought process to me is kind of like five snaps a game. So you look at 60, you know, that's what 60 snaps out of 12 games. Yeah. Factor in SEC championship game and then two, and then two college football playoff games. Oh, you know, so you're looking at, you know, that's just still under a hundred snaps. And so, so best case scenario, I still think he's, he's, probably good for five a game i see it as a like a rotational thing late in the first half they're gonna give giving some guys a blow before they come back out to to close out the half stuff like that um if he's playing more than that i think it's either he takes some sort of massive jump over the fall there's a technique thing that rock bell tony's identified there's some sort of you know like you said he's playing too high they get him to come lower something like that or we're dealing with some injuries and they want a veteran presence out there. Yeah. And and I'm not alone in this opinion, right? Like I I don't want y'all to think that I'm just some negative Nancy for all of this. Um, Cole Pinkston, I I thought I had his article pulled up. I do not, but you know, he always does a great film breakdown of, you know, when, when guys commit and he talked about like, he needs development, you know, to be an sec passer. He talked about how he didn't have a whole lot of, pass rushing moves in his tool belt. So like, I'm not on an Island on this. Um, But Lindsay, I think this opens up and I don't want to get too in depth in this, but I think it's interesting to talk about. Like this is an example where I don't know if the portal helps this kid. And once again, I I don't know this kid's personal situation. I have no idea. Maybe his goal was just to get on an sec roster. And if that's the case, props to him, he makes this roster better. I cannot stress that enough. 
but I mean, he, he was he was a he was a solid player for Western Kentucky, and it's like th- this need just to enter the portal because you feel like there's something better and the grass is always greener. I mean, you're seeing a lot of really solid players that were really key contributors for these smaller schools sitting in the portal, and their situation doesn't get better. And once again, it varies from person to person and what they want and what their goals are. But I, I, I just, I, I hope this helps them. I, I really, really hope it helps them. Yeah, this is the flip side of the portal that folks don't talk about is how there's so many players that enter the portal and don't find a home. Or right. they find a home and it ends up not being a better situation than what they left. And obviously, like you said, a lot of players leave for reasons that are not strictly football related. Right. Uh, they need to get back to home. Um, they, they're a Justin Powell just trying to collect every school in the country. There's different reasons why guys transfer. Yeah. Uh, but if he's transferring for football reasons to try to imp- like it it's an odd decision to make it really is and and it's something where i think that's the part that we miss about the transfer portal is it's not always the best thing we've heard some coaches say that but the coaches that say that are typically saying that from the perspective of they want to get rid of the transfer portal we can kind of sit sit back from the outside and say no they're right it's not always the best situation kind of given what we know about him i don't know if he's going to get enough chances to put plays on film to be in it, an NFL prospect. I yeah, mean, right. he's not. And like you said, I, maybe I, he I just wants him, to be in the SEC. I think him getting another 400 snaps at Western Kentucky would help him get to the league faster. But maybe he can come in and really impress and be find a way to be the third pass rusher. That'd be, that'd be huge for him. It'd be huge for Auburn. We're all rooting for him. This is what Cole Pinkston said at uh, AuburnLive.com. Even though he played all along the defensive line, the Florida native – will probably stay at the stand-up edge spot to add depth. He doesn't have a full arsenal of pass rushing moves, but rather uses his bigger body to collapse the pocket with power. He sometimes didn't have success with this. It could be something that hinders him when moving into the SEC level. So um, just alter expectations. I, I think Auburn should still go out and find an edge that they just like the kids' traits, that's a redshirt freshman or a redshirt sophomore that can come in because the big question, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't, this addresses the issue of depth in 2022, Lindsay, but the bigger issue um, in both on, in the trenches on both sides of the football is after this season, 2023. Right? Yeah. After this season. And so, you know, you're losing Eku and Derek Hall after, after this year, and you will also lose Marcus Bragg. And you will also, um, you'll also lose guys like Kobe Wooden and, and Morris Joseph and Marquise Burks, and so this this addition doesn't really help that. So just something yeah. to um, just something to keep in mind there. All right, the Auburn Tigers continue their run in the College World Series later today as they take on Stanford Monday afternoon. We touch on that in just a moment, right here on Locked On Auburn. Before we jump into some baseball talk, would like to ask you to join the Locked On Auburn Discord. Uh, Football talk all day long, every single day, and it really heats up whenever Auburn adds guys in the portal. Like Marcus Bragg, it's fun to get everybody's thoughts. We're all sharing links of YouTube videos to watch his tape and discuss everything together. It's fun. So the Discord link is in the episode description down below. All right, Lindsey Crosby. That was a rough one against the Old Miss. Hang on. Auburn. Yes. To continue to pump your Discord. Yeah. Um, on, I think it was Saturday morning, I dropped, thanks to my friends at Locked On MLB Prospects, the podcast that I host, I dropped MLB Scouts notes for all of Old Miss's hitters and pitchers. I should have also sent them to the, uh, apparently to the players, but uh, Discord members, we have a, an Auburn baseball channel. They got to see... MLB scouting notes on all of the hitters and pitchers for Old Miss going into that matchup. The same thing will happen today. Uh, sometime on Monday morning, I'll drop the same notes for Stanford's hitters and pitching staff for anybody in the Discord to watch. I don't have the uh, the ability, the rights from this person to share these publicly. These are proprietary to the teams. 
Sure. But he did share them with me, did tell them I could privately show them to some people. So that'll there be you. exclusive to the Discord. Yes, check that out. It'll uh, help you watch the game. All right, so uh, the the stint against Ole Miss was bad. That was really, really tough to watch. Um, took Gonzo a little bit to really get going, and the bats never really did anything. So what needs to change as a take on Stanford in their second game of the College World Series? So a couple things. Uh, one, you have to get more production from the top of the lineup. So right. Blake Rambush and Cole Foster – um, combined in the last, I think it's three games, are one for 12, one for 13. I mean, you've got to have better production than that from the top two. And this is a Cole Foster who hit three home runs in one, in, in one game of the regionals. But in Supers and now in the College World Series, they've been completely cold. Um, the only time Blake Rambush got on was late in the game in the eighth, and he promptly got backpicked um, there on a – by the catcher for the third out of the inning. Kind of killed a rally there. And so uh, the top of the lineup, I mean, everybody needs to hit. We only had four hits. Everybody needs to do better offensively, but we need the top of the lineup going for a few reasons. One, obviously, is to try to build some momentum in an inning. But yeah. then two, having runners on in front of Sonny Deshera makes pitchers approach him differently. Right. Uh, there, He gets different pitches to hit. Uh, they change the strategy coming into a Sonny share at bat when there's guys on base because he is such a threat to put the ball in play every time he's up to bat. So yeah. uh, that's got to be the first thing. And then two, you cannot come out slow. We, you mentioned Joseph Gonzalez struggling in the first inning. He gave up three straight two out hits, uh, two, two runs put in for Ole Miss there. And it was something where he didn't have the sinker. Just, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the slider, the slider was not there. And then it's, Sinker ballers, it all comes down to just inches. And he didn't just didn't have enough break on his stuff. He figured it out. He figured out, you know, enough to get into the sixth inning with only three runs allowed. But you've got to start quickly. You're starting Trace Bright for game two. Butch Thompson came out and kind of explained that that uh the way he wants to set it up is he wants, if you're going to go to the championship, you've got to win four games in four days. So his plan was Trace Bright on Monday, Mason Barnett on Tuesday, a start for lefty Carson Skipper on Wednesday, Joseph Gonzalez on Thursday on regular rest, and that would get you to the College World Series, which would start, I'm sorry, the championship, which would start on Saturday. Um, That'd a be lot wild. Of people, that'd, that'd be wild. Be wild. Um, I think it's only happened one time in history. It's tough. Yeah, they, they were talking about how you know big that first game is, and obviously mm -hmm. it's huge. The... um. A storyline going into Omaha was Stanford relying on home runs a ton, and it's hard to hit home runs in this massive park. They did not score often against Arkansas. In fact, they got boat raced, absolutely destroyed, like seventeen to two. I think when that's the final, it was seventeen to two. Uh, part really of that was the last pitcher for Stanford was a sacrificial lamb, and he gave up. I want to say six or seven runs towards the end there. Uh, but it's not like it was close before that. They right. got boat raced. Uh, the thing about this offense, they hit a lot of home runs, but they're really good contact hitters in general. So only two of the starting nine have batting averages under 300. Mm. And both those guys have a 298. So they're close. Wow. Uh, yeah, they've got they've got six players with, um, with double-digit home runs. Four of them have more than 15 home runs. Um, so very good offensive team, very good at hitting, very good at getting on base. Uh, but like you said, a lot of power hitting. They don't do a lot of stealing. Uh, it's a lot of home runs. You don't see as many of those in Omaha. And the ones that you do, you see guys try to rob. Shout out to Mike Bello for so close to getting that ball in the first inning. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be something. You're going to have to come out, execute your pitches. You're going to have to do it from the very beginning. They're a leadoff hitter. Happens to be a projected first round draft pick in, in center footer Brock Jones, who is batting 321 with 21 home runs. Yikes. So the very first at bat is tough against Stanford. And this lineup, like I said, top to bottom, the worst hitters are batting 298. Cool. So you don't get a uh, you don't get an inning off, you don't get an at bat off. You have to be on from the very beginning. And I think that's the reason they're going with Trace Bright over Mason Barnett is Trace Bright has a lower ceiling, but a higher floor. 
when Mason Barnett is on, he is absolutely electric. He is, I mean, he is draftable MLB level pitcher. When he is not on, he can give up crooked numbers in a hurry until he figures it out. Trace Bright gives you a better chance of having that base level of competency up front, and they will not be afraid to go to the bullpen early if they need to. Lindsey Crosby, thank you so much for your time and insight as always. How can people find all of your baseball writing and hear all of your baseball knowledge? So I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Uh, my show, Locked on MLB Prospects, is available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. You can find it on Twitter at Locked on Farm. The Auburn baseball writings at AuburnDaily.com and the merch at AUShirts.com. The man is everywhere. I tell you, he's on like a bunch of radio shows every day too. All right, that does it for today's edition of the show. Tomorrow, a little Charlie Tuesday action as we are joined by Auburn message board legend, Charlie Five. We will also recap Auburn baseball's stint in the College World Series. All that and more coming up right here on Locked on Auburn.